Well, 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 welcome back. I've had a bit of a break. We're going to look at today the British National Championships from about 10 days ago, whether Ineos, whether their team tactics were great, whether they were just too strong, how it went down at this race, which had a pretty good field. 170 k's long, they did 12 laps of this hard circuit in Lincoln, finishing each lap with this Michael Gate cobbled climb, pretty disgusting stuff, 500 meters at 9% with steeper pinches, and pretty stacked field. We don't have Pidcock, Froome, Thomas Mindus, Froome do national champs. We do have a lot of other young talent, some of which you may not be familiar with, like Jake Stewart, Ethan Hayter, Fred Wright, Matthew Walls, who won recently, I think, on Bora, as well as Cav being here as well and James Shaw who just signed a deal with Education First. Good to see him back in the World Tour. Cav, the only man not covering his sleeves at the start line. What does that mean? I don't know. But they rolled out and not too much actually happened straight off the bat. So I'll take this moment to thank actually Lawrence at British Cycling who sent this footage over and was like, have a go at it. And so here I'll show the first time they did the climb pretty much in its entirety. You can see there's obviously the cobbles in the middle, but then the smoother section on the path. The problem then is the raised garters on the side and the people with their iPhones or, I don't know, our Android phones sold in the UK taking photos. This is Lewis Askey, by the way, not Jake Stewart. He's currently on the FDJ Conti team. And he's pretty good. And that FDJ Conti team's got a lot of young talent. Uh, Joe Pidcock, Marin Vandenberg, who they are sort of not signing, I don't think, for some bizarre reason. But Askey's good, and he's jumping up to world tour level with FDJ next year. And you can see as he went through the finish line, that chicane in that area, if you've got front position, once it flattens off there, it's actually very, very hard to pass you. But we still have about three and a half hours of racing left. Bigham caught Askey and created a small group, I think, with Samuel Watson. It always amuses me, particularly when I'm watching like British racing. This is an amateur racing, but there's guys here who are not full-time world tour professionals, and they're getting in better aerodynamic positions. They're wearing better kit and more cognizant of aerodynamics, particularly on a race which is largely flat here, than a lot of world tour teams are. It seems to almost be a cultural thing in cycling in Britain. There's like the hill climb stuff. People seem to love tinkering with their bikes. Indeed, I just interviewed Alex Dowsett. This is like, for some reason, it's British week on my channel or across on the Lantern Rouge Cycling Podcast. I've even got the women's race tomorrow, I think, on this channel. And then also talking about Thomas Fury signs at Ineos. But yeah, on the podcast, I just uploaded an interview with Alex Dowsett about his hour record attempt. But a large group formed with Ben Swift, the former national champion with the number one on his back in a group with Jake Stewart and Harry Tanfield as well as McClay and they're being chased by Matthew Walls on Bora Hansgrohe and Fred Wright particularly on Bahrain Victoria it's probably the two big names that missed the split still with over like three hours to go of racing and the beneficiaries of that are Ethan Hayter on Ineos presuming of course for present purposes for this video I'm assuming everyone on the same trade team is riding as a team in this race and the Ribble guys are also able to sit on with a rider up the road and I think Connor Swift who's just hidden because he's got McClay on Arkea Samzik up the road as well but in the first group they had a gap about 20 to 30 seconds they didn't go crazy on the climb and Hayter bridged across or used the climb to really bridge across that gap and he really reminds me of 2015 Thomas the parallels are, are eerie in terms of height track background Ethan Hayter coming across weight as well the sort of rider he is the cadence he rides with you can see on the front here very smooth lower cadence often than a lot of the other riders but he's even been getting results uphill this year at Tour of Britain but particularly I think Andalusia against Miguel Angel Lopez just an absolute monster talent and you see Harry Tanfield also on that Victor Campanart's position as well for Quebec Assos and Jake Stewart I'm not sure if he had a mechanical or got dropped but we've got a pretty nasty group up ahead most of the big contenders are there and it's Matthew Matthew Holmes, I think the biggest name in this second group for Lotto Sudal, who's missed out 52 seconds behind. And it's again, Connor Swift attacking or just increasing the pace on that climb, putting people under pressure, but it didn't really create any separation until the flatter bit after this Michael Gate climb where in your, well, RK were happy to let wheels go. And this is what I don't understand here. We've got Fred Wright snapping across to Ben Swift because Harry Tanfield and Dan McClay have attacked and Ethan Hayter doesn't mark Fred Wright. And if you don't know Fred Wright, if you haven't been watching Tour de Hungary, the Hausler Bauhaus Fred Wright combo 1-1 one, one or 2-1 race, I mean, quit your job and know what you're doing not watching that stuff. He's been a really good lead out man this year. And then on the Heraldsbergen stage in Benelux Tour with Colbrelli and Morich, he was an absolute beast on that hard stage too. So Hayter's sitting on. 
He seems to have decided he's happy with the composition of this group ahead with Ben Swift with the likes of Fred Wright, which was, as I said, a little bit surprising to me because I really rate Fred Wright. I think he's pretty fast, even on this sort of uphill finish, if he's as fresh as Ben Swift. McLean Tanfield, less of a threat on the climb, but big engines nonetheless. So this gap goes out. It gets, I think the highest I saw was about a minute and seven. And I'm going to skip forward loads of laps because this is pretty much the status quo for ages. And I now want to focus on Harry Tanfield and how he approached this climb. He's a big boy. He's like 190 centimeters plus, I think, heavier than the likes of Ben Swift. And before each climb, he would stop taking a pull just beforehand in the run-in, just ease up, maybe have a drink. And then just before the climb, before this left-hand turn, every time he'd move to the front in front of Fred Wright. And McClay, by the way, who struggled on the climb just as much, I think, as Tanfield. Didn't do this on any of the laps of the climb. But you see, Tanfield's just keeping the pressure on so there's not a big speed differential if someone attacks at the base. And he hits the climb first every single time, gets in the right gutter. He seemed to prefer that, even though he struggled when it bends up ahead on the left-hand side. He seemed to prefer the right-hand gutter. He went there every time. And so McClay's in the left-hand gutter. So if you want to attack, which Fred Wright doesn't really seem to want to he just wants to ride tempo and i guess maybe that's the the hater threat behind he's like okay i can live with ben swift in my group but we've got to keep hustling so hater doesn't come back but yeah tanfield's got this slipping room no one's decided to attack he's able to slip a little bit and he just is able to keep in contact and this happens lap after lap on this Michael Gate climb, except the last lap. So just interesting to look at how bigger guys approach like a short, punchy climb like that. Positioning's important, and then maybe giving the illusion of being strong on the front, setting your own pace initially, whereas Haters whittled that group down. He's now in a group with Askey and Connor Swift, and both he and Ben Swift were working on the front, as well as Connor Swift and McClay. It was just somewhat curious, and that's why I was like... Are the are the trade team guys working together? Like I know Fred Wright's hundred percent going for his own result, but like the Ineos team car was always talking to Ethan Hayter, and the commissaires were pretty regularly the motos or the British cycling car up alongside them. And yeah, you got two guys in two groups of four each both working, uh, even though they're on the same trade team. And you can see it, Ineos going to speak to the Ben Swift group up ahead. Maybe the Ineos guys were just happy with the status quo, which is to have the pressure of Hater. You know, you don't want him to come back behind if you're on this front group. And they knew they could maybe play that out a little bit on the last lap, and it was too early to have the two groups come back together. But yeah, Hater even stopped working a little bit sometimes. You see Alex Richardson on Alpes and Phoenix taking it up there. And I think even Adam Blythe was surprised a little bit on the live commentary for this, which was streamed, by the way, live on the British Cycling YouTube channel, that Hater, okay, fair enough, you don't want to pull on the flat, uh, yeah, and you just bring the other guys with you, particularly Connor Swift and Askey, pretty strong guys. But I was also surprised that on this climb, Hater didn't use the opportunity to try and bridge across, and then you have Ben Swift sit on the group after the climb, and then, yeah, Hater, they can have a two-on-one in this group and make a group of five or six. But I gotta say, in this interlude, I think we've got about three laps to go. British cycling, as much as it pains me to say it, the classics guys they got coming through are pretty damn strong. Peacock, Ethan Hater, Jake Stewart, Fred Wright, Matthew Walls, they're all pretty good and miserable conditions or rainy conditions, just like their forefathers, Luke Rowe, Stannard, etc. So I'm really interested to see the combination of Peacock and Hater, hopefully, in some of those classics next year, like Omloop. I think they could be pretty lethal. But with the gap now at a minute to that second group, Fred Wright decides to put pay to at least Tanfield and McClay on this Michael Gate climb. And yeah, I just think Tanfield rode to the best of his abilities on these climbs. I don't think the circuit suited him particularly. And yeah, let me know down below, do you think Fred Wright was riding his race because he was concerned about Hayter coming back from behind? Because yeah, Hayter in these uphill finishes is super fast. He also he just won the National Time Trial Championships, I think a few days before this. So Fred Wright hits the accelerator and only Ben Swift can really go with him. McClay's race in terms of winning this race is done. And you can see Tanfield just clawing himself back on on the flatter section. And how hard it is to pass riders. Fred Wright's got first position there. And this is what I was saying. Hater doesn't really respond or attack. Maybe he didn't feel it. I don't know. But he just follows Askey on this second last lap with a minute gap to the guys in front. And for RKS Samzik, assuming they're riding as a team, with Connor Swift and 
Dan McClay. Well, they've now had McClay drop from this group of three, and Tanville's trying to think, how am I going to beat these two guys who are way quicker than me on this final climb finishing up here? I'm going to have to attack them at some point. And that's something I want to touch on in the second video this week, where I'll look at Tour de France Stage 7, where I think, and I was critical at the time, Sturvin got in a group of guys where he could never really win, and Trek, despite having three guys in the group, were sort of rest on their laurel and said, we're good with that group composition. Depending on the composition of whatever group forms, it's not always the best out come to have your rider there if you can't win from that group but Tanfield eventually does what he needs to do winds it up with one lap to go because he knows he can't beat these guys on the climb once he has it wound up it's pretty hard to bring back and it's Ben Swift who actually loses a bit off Fred Wright's wheel and so this is good for Wright yes he has to close it down but he's got Ben Swift off the back and even up to this point even though surely Ben Swift must know the race situation that Hayter's not too far behind and is chasing he continues to pull with this group of three, despite Tanfield having just attacked him. Now, not the longest pull in the world either, but it's only when the cars do their final round, you see here Hater with Askey about 30 seconds behind. Hater calls up, I think, the British cycling car and maybe asks for a status check. I'm assuming that's what he's doing, asking what the race situation is. And the Ineos car has just driven up ahead. Obviously, what should happen is... Ben Swift sits on, and by sitting on, he puts a lot of pressure on Fred Wright to nullify him or weaken him a little bit before the finish. So even if Hayter doesn't catch back up, Swift has more of a chance of winning from that group. And you've got to remember, these guys don't have race radios. I'm not a big fan of not having race radios in these races. Now, maybe not everyone has them sorted, but again... Swift makes Fred Wright closes. And I think this is about the only thing Wright could have done differently would have been to force Swift to close down Tanfield. Obviously, there's a risk. You let Tanfield go, Tanfield might win. But the way Wright rode the last sort of eight kilometers closing down every Tanfield move, it put himself in a very difficult position in terms of actually beating Ben Swift. And this is where I really think the hater effect comes into play because Swift's now been told the race situation surely and he does not take another pull for the rest of this race. He knows haters behind. And this is, again, what I think Ineos can do with Pidcock and Hater in one-day races next year. They're both quick. They're both guys who the opposite of what I said before is like, oh, do you really want them in that group? Both of them are fast enough to win reduced bunch finishes, even against top, top guys. You can almost see here when the moto tells Wright the race situation, Wright accelerating, and I'm completely speculating, but I'm assuming he said Hater and Co. or the two are about 20 seconds behind you, and Wright gets on it once again. Because he, I guess, has to take his chance of, okay, maybe I can beat Swift on this uphill finish. Hater, probably not. Tanfield does, again, an attack on the flat before the final finish, and it's Wright having to close it down. I think the British Championships is normally in in June or something. It's in October this year because they delayed it. Great to see loads of crowds and obviously circuit courses like this are always so good. They got to see the riders 12 times, I think, on the Michael Gate climb. Harry Tanfield, I'm not sure what his plans are next year. He's on Quebec Assault, according to PCS, he's out of contract and Quebec, are, I'm not sure about their future either. But here we are coming into the final circuit as Fred Wright, who wants to, I think, finesse. If Hayter wasn't there, Fred Wright would have been finessing more and he's concerned about him and that's why he's pulling. And I think Tanfield eventually decides he may as well ride for third or just, just ride it in and go to the front again for the start of that climb up to Michael Gate. And I just saw actually in the press about two days ago, apparently uh, Britain or British cycling, I'm not sure who, is bidding for the 2026 Tour de France Grand Depart, which I mean, it's just a shame Britain doesn't have more world tour racing because like they have cobbles, they got kind of miserable weather and they got a lot of fans that seem to want to come out. Maybe it's really expensive to, to run the race. I assume it is. But right when early, Swift countered on the steepest part of this climb and he gets that first position through this left-hand corner just as Fred Wright has to get back in the saddle and that closes Wright off a little bit who has to yield a full bike length to Swift and we've got the right-hander coming up and as I said it's just really hard to pass although I don't think position would have made a big enough difference for Wright who had to work a lot more than Swift in the last lap 
closing down Tanfield and then working on the front with the threat of Hayter behind with Ben Swift on Ineos, not after his best year ever, taking the British National Championships Road Race W with Fred Wright, a valiant second, Hayter third for the Ineos 1-3 and Tanfield probably would have got third to be honest if he'd ridden for third, but good on him for actually attacking on the flat, trying to go for the win. But I hope you enjoyed the video. Like it down below if you did. I have off-season content planned. Don't worry, top 10 climbing performances of the year, best domestique of the year, all that sort of stuff and more. That's why I went out and bought the race right so we can relook at those moments at the end of the year as well as loads of stuff and team previews on the Lantern Rouge Cycling Podcast. But until next time, ciao.